Hello and welcome to Scientist Warning TV and today I'm pleased to have with me biologist and conservationist Professor Dave Goulson from the University of Sussex. Um, Dave was listed at number eight in BBC Wildlife magazine's list of top 50 conservation heroes in 2015. He's published extensively on ecology and the conservation of insects, particularly bumblebees, and has just published a new book, Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypse. So welcome, Dave. Thank you for finding the time to talk with me today. Hi, Alison. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Um, on your book, I have a copy of it here. Um, we are delighted to, to recommend this. It's a wonderful book. It has a beautiful illustration on the cover. And one of the things that struck me in looking at it is it's, it simply oozes your enthusiasm um, and interest in insects. I mean, it just the whole thing comes alive. You write it incredibly well. Um, so clearly, clearly, you're you know you're you're not just a scientist who um, explores a topic. You've clearly got a, a deep interest in in insects. And I wondered if you could start perhaps by saying a little bit about what fueled that interest in you. you know, how did you come to be so fascinated by insects in the first place? And yeah. why why are they important? Uh, so the first one is actually quite tricky because I I don't know. I was <laughs> born this way. You know, it's. So when I was only five or six years old, I started collecting, you know, searching for caterpillars around the school playground and the hedges around the edge of the school field and, and taking them home in my lunchbox and rearing them up until they turned into, into moths and butterflies. And I just thought it was amazing and was hooked. And so I don't know, but I do think that actually a lot of kids have a kind of bug phase when they're little and they love to catch things and hold them and give them names and learn about them. But sadly, they, they grow out of it. Um, mm. And most teenagers and adults don't, you know, they're, they're frightened of insects. Their reaction, if anything comes near them, buzzing around is to try and swat it, which is... Mm. So my, my sort of mission in life these days is trying to persuade people to, to love insects or, or at the very least to, you know, to respect them because mm. they're really important. So this second part of your question, you know, why are they important? Um, I mean, actually, it will take a while to fully explain because they, they do so many things. But I mean, very briefly, they make up the bulk of life on Earth in terms of numbers of species. More than two thirds of all known species are insects. Um, they're food for a, a huge proportion of the other creatures. You know, most birds, bats, lizards, freshwater fish, um, you know, and so on and so on, live on insects or either partly or sometimes entirely. Um, and then they do a whole bunch of other things, like they, they recycle um, dead bodies and, and uh, cow pats and oh. trees and leaves and all sorts of other um, things. Um, so they're so really important in, in nutrient cycles and they keep the soil healthy or they help to keep it healthy and they distribute seeds for plants. And of course they pollinate, that's perhaps mm. the thing that most people already recognize. Um, which is incredibly important. You know, the, the very large majority of all the plant species in the world need pollinating um, by some kind of animal, and it's usually an insect. Um, and, and roughly three quarters of all the crops we grow in the world need pollinating by insects. So, you know, we have a very direct link to the, you know, our health depends very much on the health of these little creatures, whether we appreciate mm. them. Yeah, yeah. And... One of the points, in, there are many points in your book that resonate, but one point you make in particular, and you put it as a question, I think, which is, you know, why do we have to demonstrate the value, the financial value of, of insects to politicians? And you talk about bashing them over the head and having to make a case for their existence. And you say, why, why can't we just appreciate them? And why can't we just accept their right to, 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 to life on the planet, just as, as we have a right to, to life on the planet? And it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a very good point, I thought. Yeah, I mean, you know, people so often ask me, you know, what's the point of mosquitoes or wasps or, you know, you could put any, there's a whole bunch of insects people stick in to that sentence because they don't like them. Mm. But the wasps, if they could speak, might well ask each other, what's the point of those humans, <laughs> you know? Um, we, we, there are, it's undoubtedly true that insects are important, but it's also undoubtedly true that there are probably lots of them that could go extinct mm. and it would make a blind bit of difference to mm. us. Um, you know, economically or whatever, mm. but it would be a terrible shame, you know, um, 
I mean, then there are examples of this. So, for you know, the St. Helena giant earwig is now extinct. It only ever mm. lived in seabird colonies on the island of St. Helena. It was the biggest earwig the world ever knew. Mm. Now it's gone. You know, the world goes on without it. But it's a slightly, the world is slightly poorer for the loss of that creature, even though most of us were never going to see one, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we're on this rock floating in space with a kind of, uh, you know, life clinging to its surface. It's, I mean, when you stop to think about it, it's it's amazing and mm. ridiculous. And, and it gives us, you know, everything. Um, it's our home. And 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 so I find it so odd that we don't value mm. our kind of travellers on this rock in space, but we, we don't seem to at the moment, sadly. We don't. Exactly. Um, and we'll come back to some of those points that you, you've raised um, in, with some of my, my, my later questions. Um, so in parts two and three, you look at the um, declines of insects and the causes of the declines. And of course, a couple of years ago, um, there was a lot of interest in a report and it was published in The Guardian and various other newspapers, too, um, talking about the insect apocalypse. And and it was interesting because it made it really clear that A, the situation was pretty bad and B, we can't just lose all our insects because the whole life chain, you know, the, there's a whole sort of um, ecology and, and series of systems that depend on insects. Um, but it was controversial. And I wondered if you could say something about, to the best of your knowledge, you know, what is our current best understanding about insect declines? I mean, are we really heading into an insect apocalypse as you, as you talk about in, in your book? Uh, yeah, how, how bad is it? Yeah, so the, the study you're referring to, I mean, it did cause quite a bit of controversy in, in part because um, there was a, a quote in the, well, there was a, a sentence in the Guardian newspaper saying that insects might be extinct by the end of the century or something like that. And a lot of scientists quite rightly said, well, hang on a minute, you know, mm. that's a hell of an extrapolation. And, and, uh, and actually the reality is that there are some insect species that are tough as old boots that will be around long after us. Um, and, you know, there is no danger of house flies, for example, going extinct anytime soon. Mm. Uh, they 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 love all the filth we create they're <laughs> fast breeding huge population anyway so so um there was a bit of a backlash uh, because i think the authors of that particular paper slightly over egged it um but that unfor that was really unfortunate in a way because it, mm. it, it it was then used as ammunition by the mm. folk who want to carry on with business as usual mm saying oh it's there's not really a problem with the insects at all which is completely untrue you know there mm. is a lot of evidence showing that insects are in in rapid decline it's 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 somewhat patchy so you know we've named over a million species of insect and the large majority of them aren't being regularly monitored at all mm. but all the ones that are all the long-term kind of data sets that exist or almost all of them show declines and some of the rates of decline are really quite alarming um, there was a German study which has been widely cited um, mm. a, a 76 percent decline in in the biomass of flying insects over a 26 year period um, up to 2016 you know so I mean it seems like if, if that's a true reflection of what's happened in Germany three quarters of the, the insects have disappeared and that's terrifying um and there, there are lots of other studies that suggest that this isn't something weird happening in germany that there really has been a considerable loss of insects so for example uk butterfly populations are down by about 50 percent and that's really hard data since the 1970s um and what's what's also interesting is that most of the monitoring that we do have most of the data we have starts in the 70s or mm. 80s but there was a Dutch study that came out last year, which tried to kind of extrapolate butterfly populations further back in history using museum collections. And they estimated that Dutch butterflies have declined by 84% since the mm -hmm. beginning of the century. So, you know, um, we're talking about pretty massive declines and there, and there are big kind of confidence limits on exactly how big yeah. those have been. But all the evidence is that they're ongoing. This isn't this isn't something that we fixed. So you know we are basically studying the tail end of a century long 
um, steady decline of, of insect populations, which you know, we yeah. absolutely have to stop. It's, it's alarming. It's, it's truly alarming when you think about um, our dependence on insects. Um, well, not direct dependence, but sort of indirect um, to other species as well. Um, but in terms of looking at the causes of decline, and you know, I'll just read some out, we've got, we've got loss of habitat, we've got pesticides, you know, the infamous Monsanto and the glyphosate, herbicides, um, diseases, light pollution, invasive species, climate change, shifting growing seasons. It must be quite a challenge to try to model based on the information that you have, which as you say is relatively recent. It must be an extraordinary challenge to try to model what might be happening to those populations and to then infer whether or not we are at the brink of some kind of catastrophe. So can we be sure that we haven't set in train a sort of series of cascading events, if you like, that could lead us to something unexpected? Um, because of course, in, in relation to the, you know, the research on climate change, a lot of it is faster than expected. Um, things are happening more quickly than people can, can, can perhaps keep up with. Is the same happening, would you say, in terms of biodiversity and insects in particular? It, I mean, the, the honest truth is, you know, nobody can model or predict the such a complicated combinations of, of events um and people have tried they generally scientists focus on one thing at a time because that's pretty even that's quite tricky mm. so for example there have been attempts to, mo to to model the impacts of climate change on bumblebees and butterflies and so on and and inevitably they're overwhelmingly negative but nobody is trying to factor in simultaneously factor in the impacts of changing light pollution, which will inevitably mm. continue, climate change, which of course will inevitably continue, but we don't know exactly what route, what course it's going to take. Um, habitat loss is, um, is is probably still one of the biggest drivers, um, mm. particularly in 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 the tropics, with you know rainforest still being burnt down and and so on, and. It's very likely that, that actually many insects that we've lost so much of their habitat that they're now persisting in little tiny fragments and the populations in those fragments are probably or in many cases doomed to extinction because they're too small and too mm. isolated to be viable long term. Um, so even if we did nothing else and even if the climate were to suddenly stabilise, which of course isn't going to happen, um, then probably we will continue to lose species for quite some time into the future. Um, but of course, actually, you know, the climate is not stabilizing. The human population is still growing. We're still mm. down forests and destroying habitat and so on. So, um, yeah, it's hard to be terribly optimistic. And, you know, we're undoubtedly going to lose a lot more insects. Um, and at what point that will become catastrophic and, you know, reach a point of kind of ecosystem collapse is is impossible to say and there's a, you know this this analogy that Paul Early came out with many decades ago where he compared um you know individual species to the rivets that hold the plane together mm. and you know as he said you know you could you can pull some of the rivets out of a plane and it'll still take off and fly and land and you can pull a few more out and it'll still take off and fly and land but if you keep doing it mm then there will come a point where there's, there's a catastrophic event and a wind falls off and everyone dies. And it's, you know, mm. so his analogy is that species and you could substitute insects there, you know, they are the rivets that hold mm. ecosystems together. And we just don't know when that, you know, point of collapse will be. Is it next week or in 20 years or 50 years? I don't know. Nobody knows. It's, it's, ter it's terrifying, actually. It's terrifying to think that we could have set something off um, that we can't predict and that we will not be able to control. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next question, really, because for you as a scientist who've been working in this field for a few decades, it must be galling to publish your research papers, to talk about what, what's happening, to warn people to warn um, MPs if they will listen to you. I noticed in your book that, you know, you've made a comment about talking to MPs and only a handful of them turned up. Um, I mean, but it makes the point in that 
um, those in power are, are not necessarily listening and they're certainly not heeding. So, I mean, I often say warnings don't work because however many scientists might, um, might warn about impending catastrophe in relation to climate and greenhouse gas emissions or in relation to loss of biodiversity, what seems clear is that warnings don't work. Um, it then raises the question, and the question is sort of captured in a sense, but in a quote that Julia Steenberger made recently, she's an ecological economist. Um, she tweeted recently that the problem wasn't that politicians don't understand the science, it's that scientists don't understand politics. So I guess a question I'd like to put to you is that in addition to, yes, we have to raise awareness, absolutely, and talk about all of this as people like Catherine Hayhoe and Michael Mann advocate incredibly well. But what more can scientists and academics do? Is there, it, it seems to me that we're at a point where potentially there's a challenge to, to, to academia to do more than simply go about the day job. And I just wondered if, as a scientist, whether you've um, been involved in conversations with, with other, you know, with colleagues around, around these sorts of lines. Is there, and what are your thoughts on whether scientists can actually do more? It's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I, I spent decades working as a, as a sort of conventional scientist. I, I actually, my, uh, early, in my early years as an academic, I studied bee foraging behavior nothing to do with their conservation at all. But then I noticed that, that they seem to be declining and that certain rare species, I couldn't find them anywhere and, mm. and turned my attention to kind of understanding their decline, particularly bumblebees are basically my kind of mm. group. Um, and we published lots of papers on, on why some species were declining more than others, what their habitat requirements were, what we might do, how we could put more flowers back into farmland, how garden management could influence how well they did. And, and you know, you, you then you publish them in these dry scientific papers that mm -hmm. no needs at all, apart mm -hmm. from a handful of other scientists in your discipline. Um, and, and after a few years of this, I just thought, well, what is the point of this? You know, mm. this isn't achieving anything. All I'm doing is, is, you know, sharing information with a few other people who can't do anything themselves. And, you mm. know, politician was reading them, no nature reserve ward, no ordinary member of the public. So, so I sort of got frustrated and started racking my brains. You know, what can I do as a scientist? Um, I, I started a charity, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, mm. back 2006 just to try and you know sort of take the scientific knowledge and apply it you know create a habitat um, campaign on pesticide use and things like that and that's been successful I mean the trust the the charity itself has grown and is well established and is doing great things but yeah. it still feels like an absolute drop in the ocean compared to the you know the scale of the problem um we I mean and then so I then turn to sort of trying to communicate to a bigger audience because you know the sorts of people that join the bumblebee conservation trust are probably mostly people who are already well engaged with environmental issues is how do we get to everybody else that's mm. the real challenge uh, so i started writing popular science books and mm. the social media you know twitter and youtube i made videos on youtube and so on um, just to try and you know suck in as many people as as possible but I don't think any of it has been super successful mm. um, it's really frustrating you know and I, I must admit I, I, I I've done everything I can think of to try and you know um, convince more people to, to listen but it always feels like I'm in a kind of echo chain you know a bubble of like-minded folk mm. most of whom are probably quite old as well I give real world talks, uh, mm. which I haven't done for a while for reasons, but it's usually a sea of white hair in front of me if there's hair <laughs> at all, you know, people. Yeah. And, you know, older retired folk do an awful lot for conservation, but mm. it's the young, you know, it's, it's younger folk and, and people in government that we really need to get to listen. And yeah. that's, that's frustrating. Um, so you know, I don't have any uh, magic answers. I, I I've done my best, but uh, and I talked to many other academics, and mm. they all and uh, we're all sort of those of us that want to try and save the planet. Um, mm. 
equally frustrated as to, you know, what can we do? We, I, I think many of us are doing everything we can think of already. Yeah. And are kind of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, other scientists say much the same thing. Um, but there is one area where I think there's potentially cause to have a little bit of hope. Um, so in terms of things we can do, you talk about greening our cities and reforming farming um, and rewilding. And so you very kindly supported the um, uh, wildcard campaign, um, Rewild the Royals. Um, and as you probably know, because I've been updating yourself and other signatories that, you know, we've achieved quite a degree of success in terms of media coverage. Um, it seems that the media is quite, um, quite benign to this particular issue. It doesn't seem to be one that's positioned as a kind of socialist kind of endeavour, which is good. Um, so in terms of addressing the problem of land, land inequality and you know, a couple of stats here, uh, 50 percent of England is owned by less than one percent of the population, which is just staggering. Um, in Scotland, 450 individuals own half the land. So we've clearly got a problem here, sort of a land spiracy in a sense, your land inequality. Um, and the campaign to ask the, the royals to rewild is certainly getting some attention from the serious scientific community, you know, people like yourself, um, but also high profile public figures too. Um, I just wondered if you could say, well, first of all, what, what is rewilding? Because there is a little bit of confusion about what rewilding actually is. Um, and why do you think it can make a difference? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's ridiculous, isn't it? The land ownership in this country. I mean, it, it, I, it honestly, this country has barely changed since since the Norman conquest uh, when, you know, William dished out land <laughs> to his mates. A lot of these giant estates haven't really changed since that time. I mean, it's, mm. it, we're still essentially in a sort of feudal society, as far as I can tell, ruled by a tiny number of... Mm inherited their position but anyway that <laughs> wilding um so i think in its true sense if you like um it's rewilding is about kind of restoring natural ecological processes and trophic levels that have been lost so putting back large herbivores ideally um mm -hmm. the landscape and in a really I, the ideal is to also add in their predators things like wolves and bears and lynx and so on mm. because the idea is that, that essentially for millennia before we came along um, nature thrived by having this kind of dynamic interaction between these these different species and the big herbivores have really big impacts on the plant communities um, and uh and, and they themselves are impacted upon and kept in check by their predators and so on. Um, and that, you know, so I was brought up with the notion that, that Europe was a dense primeval forest before people came and chopped it all down. Mm. But, but now the, the, there's a widespread belief among scientists that actually it was much more open than that. And it was open mm -hmm. because these large herbivores that we've, we've wiped out, knocked over trees, dug holes in the ground to wallow in. They created this kind of mosaic habitat of, of open areas and woodland and more like a savanna, perhaps. Mm. And I think that that's very likely to be true. All the evidence seems to stack up to, to point to that. So therefore, rewilding is to try to, rather than having nature reserves that you kind of manage, which is the sort of traditional model of conservation. Uh, so, for example, around where I live in East Sussex, we, we have a lot of uh, uh, chalk downland, most of it's been turned over to intensive farmland and all the wildlife. Mm. There are a few fragments of lovely flower rich downland left. Mm. They have to be managed, they have to be cut, and the scrub has to be bashed back by teams of volunteers, sometimes using herbicides and so on. So it's a really kind of artificial situation. I mean, I, 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 I'm all for it continuing. We have to look after those little fragments of chalk grassland and ideally, mm. but. Um, it seems a shame that they, they have to be so heavily managed. Um, and the idea is that nature could look after itself if we mm. be wilded, if we set aside large areas of land and put in some, you know, the large mammals that have been lost. Um, and the classic example is Yellowstone Park in, in, uh, in, in the United States, where they, they had huge problems with overpopulation with deer and they put mm. in, which were the sort of missing trophic level and, and the whole system changed and, um, and is, it, it, and there's a lot 
forests started to recover and the biodiversity generally across the board increased. Um, and so, so there are people trying to do similar things in the UK now. Obviously, we're, we're, we don't have the areas that the United States has. Um, uh, everything's a much smaller scale here. And we, there are very few places where one could plausibly reintroduce wolves or bears to the United Kingdom. Although, personally, I would love to see it happen. Um, but you can put back the large herbivores. You might be able to put back lynx. You could certainly put back beaver, mm. which do a fantastic job of reducing flooding and um, creating habitat for wildlife and so on. Mm. Uh, and so there are various projects underway doing exactly that. There's one I'm familiar with, the, the NEP estate, which is in West Sussex, mm -hmm. which is a half thousand acre rewilding project, which was intensive farmland until 20 years ago. And it's, it's a fantastic place to visit. It's really interesting to see what happens if sort of nature is left to do its own thing. Um, you know, no wolves or bears, but they've, they've put back a whole range of large herbivores that uh, graze and browse and bash around and, and the pigs dig up the soil and create all sorts of disturbance. And it's, it's, um, it's a really kind of dynamic and interesting place biologically. Um, so, so that, I think, is what I would regard as rewilding. It is quite controversial when some people talk about so there's a, you can make a pretty good argument that, that we should rewild the less productive parts of Britain. Mm -hmm. um, don't produce much food. Why not use them for biodiversity and carbon sequestration rather than you know, it, trying to subsidise, for example, sheep farming, which is barely mm -hmm. economic or produces precious little and creates a, more or less an ecological desert on much of the uplands or mm -hmm. the grass more. Uh, another story i won't go into that now but uh, those areas it seems so at least some of them could be rewilded um mm. but we're not to, I really must stress nobody is proposing a kind of highland clearance style eviction of people from their land it would have to be voluntary you know if yeah. a farmer wants to rewild, great but nobody's forcing anybody to do this and nobody's even suggesting that that could be a possibility so i i really hope people don't get the wrong end of the stick on that one and, and some people do um I've come across it. Um, but you can sort of take the same concept and apply it to gardens. And mm. it's not, you know, I, I, my, I have a two acre garden. I'm really lucky and it's a wild garden. I encourage wildflowers. I encourage as much life as I can to live mm. there. Whether that's really rewilding, it depends on your kind mm. of uh, how strict you want to be on the definition. Mm. Um, but I still think it's a really valuable thing to do and it's making a, an important contribution. And, if we could get more people to manage their gardens for wildlife, it's not going to solve all of our problems, but it's it's a really nice, simple step in the right direction. Um, and Absolutely. 22 Absolutely. million gardens in mm. uh, in the United Kingdom covering mm. area of about a million acres. Mm. Uh, if they were all wild, or at least I want to say, well, I don't mean it has to be all brambles and nettles, <laughs> beautiful flowers, um, but no pesticides, as many native wildflowers as you can squeeze in, maybe mm. in a bee hotel, don't mm. have a lawn that you mow every five minutes instead mm. of long and shaggy. Really easy stuff that anyone can do. Um, and it really would make a difference if everyone kind of bought into that. It's it's a simple thing that, that we can we, we can each do. Um, you know, for example, I think recently we had a sort of campaign not to, not to mow your lawn. <laughs> so I did, I did have some grass, but I didn't I didn't mow my lawn. For sure. Um, but beyond the you know, beyond the sort of ecological benefits, I mean, there, there are wider benefits to individuals, too, um, you know, such as well-being and improvements in mental health as well, I think. So it does it does seem to be a bit of a it seems a bit of a no brainer. But as you say, there are you know, there are some political issues and, and you know, and other concerns that do need to be sorted out. Um, and as you say, some people don't like it. Um, so, you know, recently we, we saw an article um, about um Lord Dunsany, I believe it is, in, in Ireland, who rewilded his estate, but was then criticised for doing so because people thought it looked quite messy. Um, so I guess it doesn't it doesn't keep everyone happy. Um, but it would be it, it does seem to be something that's important that would be hugely beneficial at a time of because it's not just a climate emergency, it's an ecological emergency, too. So it does seem to be something that we could and should be doing. Um, so, I mean, so, so um, yeah, thank, thank you for all of those observations. Um, 
and um, you know for a, a, a wide ranging conversation um, on ecology and conservation. Just as a as a final a final comment, your book is littered with lots of illustrations and examples of in, unusual and interesting insects. What's what's your what's your favourite? What is your what is the most intriguing insect? Perhaps not necessarily in the book, but the one that you you've come across that you think is interesting and and why? Oh, I mean, it's, there are so many, you know, mm. like a million species, and uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just mo most of them actually. We I think. The, the most amazing thing really is that for most of them, we know nothing about them. Mm. And in, in fact, you know, we, it's thought that there are probably another four or five million species that we haven't even named yet. So we don't mm. even name for them, let alone know anything about their biology. And there must be all sorts of amazing, wonderful creatures out there waiting to be discovered. Mm. Don't drive them all extinct before we find one. Um, mm. But... I mean, I'm going to have to stick with my with, with my favourites, the bumblebees. <laughs> they, I mean, so they're endearing, they're colourful, mm. important as pollinators. And the thing that first hooked me on studying them is they're really smart for you know, the intellectual giants. And compass, they can navigate miles of the land, they can memorise landmarks, they can memorize which are the most rewarding flowers and learn how to extract nectar from them. You can even train them to play football, apparently, although I haven't actually done that <laughs> myself, but that's... Uh, uh, um, that's unusual. So, that, that, I mean, they're just really, really cool. Yeah, they they are. So I guess the, the, the message is for us just to open our eyes, really, and to just appreciate what's out there, because it's, it's, right, it's, it's all right in front of us and it's all valuable um, and all pretty amazing. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Um, I know that you have a petition going at the moment, so we'll put the link to the petition in the information section on this. Um, and then just finally, it's, it is a wonderful book. Um, I do recommend it if anyone you know, feels inclined to get a copy. It's beautifully written as well with lots and lots of interesting information. So thank you, Dave. Thank you, Alison. It's been fun.